Okay, so the numbers are starting to slow down. So I think we can jump in here. So good evening and thank you for joining us for the first of our webinar series here for the webinar costs, profits, and what if a look into the Canadian Cal-Calf Cost of Production Network. I am Sydney Fortier. I'm a research and innovation coordinator at the BCRC, and I will be your moderator this evening. Um, we are very happy and proud to be able to put on these webinars for free um, through the Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. So just a couple housekeeping items before I call on Brenna and Huting to present. Um, we ask you if any questions arise during the course of the presentation that you throw those into the Q&A. Um, you can do that as people are presenting and then we will get to them at the end in a live Q&A session. We just wanna remind you not to throw it in the chat, otherwise we might not be able to get to them during the Q&A session. Um, putting them in the actual box at the bottom of your Zoom, um, that'll give us a, a clear um, line to your questioning and be able to get to it in the live Q&A. Um, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent to everyone who has registered for the webinar, um, even if you were not uh, unable to attend live. So if you haven't been to beefresearch.ca in a bit, you, um, if you go on now, you'll see that we look a little bit different, but we still have all the great information and resources um, available to you. Um, we have a better search engine now, and it's also easier to navigate on your smartphone. So if you haven't gotten a chance to check us out, please do that. Um, and while you're there, if you also haven't had a chance to sign up for our blog, um, we would really love for you to do that as well. Um, we share new research, time relevant information and updates on what we're up to. As you can see, um, we also, we had our um, welcome to the new beefresearch.ca, as well as a recent blog post on practical tips for fall and winter grazing across Canada, along with all kinds of other information. Um, we also have a slew of decision tools on our website developed by the BCRC and partners. Um, producers are able to use their own operation numbers to guide informed decision making and potentially identify ways to improve productivity and profitability. There are a variety of tools that highlight topics that have an impact on the bottom line of ranches and farms and allows producers to see numbers and estimates derived from their own records. So the one that I chose for you to, um, for you guys, that for me to highlight today is our cow-calf production indicators calculator. So this only requires 15 of your own numbers and a really easy three-step process and allows you to compare to industry targets as well as regional benchmarks. So your first step would be to enter the information in the yellow highlighted cells. And on our website, this is what this kind of looks like. And you'll see at the top, you select your region followed by your production numbers. So how we have regions broken down is Western Canada, Ontario, and the Atlantic. Our second step is basically you just compare um, what you have entered in your numbers. The tool automatically calculates um, specific um, industry benchmarks and stuff for you. And then you are able to compare whether or not you meet or exceed the target, or if you are below target in terms of the industry, then that would be can Canada wide. And then step three allows you to compare the regional benchmarks. So depending on whatever region you selected, basically gives you an idea of how you are um, um, measuring up in terms of a more localized region. It also gives you these nice little graphs that allows you to um, evaluate where potential improvements can be made through breeding and weeding. Um, the amazing part about benchmarks, it lets you see where you measure up, but it also shows you um, that there's always room for, for improvement for our industry. So we're always thinking about it. Um, if you were able to join us last year, you would see, you would have known for the first time we offered CE accreditations. Unfortunately, for this webinar, we are not offering a CE credit. However, if you are interested and haven't gotten your CE credits for last year's webinars, you can go ahead and um, either pick one of these three or all three if you're interested in it. Um, you can watch a recording and answer a quiz. And if you get 70% or higher, we can give you that CE credit as well. Um, if you require any more information on this, just 
please reach out to Dana Parker. Her email is on the screen there and she can guide you in the right direction. So we encourage you guys to stay connected and speak with us. Um, so we are on Twitter, Facebook, we have our YouTube as well as our blog, and we're always putting up some good stuff on Action News through CCA's, um, um, CCA's Action News, which is their newsletter. So give us a follow. So without further ado, I'm going to call on Brenna Grant to start sharing her screen while I introduce her. Um, let me just close this. So Brenna Grant is the Executive Director of Canfax and Canfax Research Services, or CRS, responsible for business development. Canfax is Canada's source of cattle market information. CRS provides the Canadian beef industry with comprehensive statistical and market information on the domestic and global beef trends. Economic analyses are utilized for marketing, research, policy and investment decisions, supporting strategies, business plans, and performance measurement. Brenna grew up in, a south, in southwest Saskatchewan on a cow-calf yearling grasser operation that her family still operates. She received a Bachelor in Agricultural Economics from the University of Saskatchewan and a master in applied, Master's in Applied Economics from Montana State University. She is currently the Chair of the Statistics Canada Agriculture and Food Advisory Committee and chairs the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef's Climate Science Committee. CRS provides project and data management for the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, National Beef Sustainability Assessment. So please join me in welcoming Brenna Grant. Thank you, Sydney. And good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. When we started the Canadian Cow-Calf Cost of Production Network, um, we were really focused on creating benchmarks across the country. But we also know that it takes time to collect all the numbers to calculate cost of production and then go through all the number crunching. And you don't just do that for a benchmark. You really are doing that to ask some questions at the end of the day. And so tonight, we don't just want to talk about benchmarks. We also want to ask, what now? Um, this is our second year of data collection, and so we're digging in more. And so, yes, we have expanded the number of benchmarks we have available. But tonight, we're also asking, you know, so what? Where do we want to go from here? If you have questions about methodology or specific um, benchmarks for a specific farm or production system, you can go to our website for those details. And I'm gonna share more about that at the end. And so as we get started here, just a reminder that the network was created in order to provide national coverage with a standardized methodology. Um, and really one of the key pieces about the network is that we're focused on collecting the structure of a specific production system. Um, that is relatively stable from year to year. And what that does is it allows us to index both backwards um, as well as forwards. And that means that we can really reduce the response burden on producers that are participating in the program so that they can participate once and then we're not gonna go back to them again for another five years to see if there's been any structural changes in their operation. But here are some quite frankly troubling statistics for you. According to 2014 data in the U.S. small business trends, only 56% of small businesses make it past their fifth year, with 82% of business failures being caused by cash flow problems. And only 40% of small businesses are profitable, with 30% breaking even, and 30% continually losing money. This is not for agriculture, this is for all small businesses. And so we know that the small and medium-sized business world is very tough and very competitive. And this really is where a lot of agricultural producers are operating with their small and medium-sized businesses. But it really means that management is really key to success. The literature shows us that factors impacting competitiveness include controlling of production costs, calculation of financial indicators, strategic planning, and herd identification. And that really boils down to saying, 
management makes a difference. Um, these are all related to management. And a big part of that is that controlling costs. And when you think about controlling costs, how do you know if your costs are under control or out of control? And we use benchmarks to do that. And there are three different types of benchmarks out there. Um, and there is a role for each of these. The first one that you're probably familiar with is comparison of self to self um, in order to see progress over time. And this is having your own farms records and seeing what you're doing in terms of um, productivity measures, um, as well as your financial um, numbers year over year to see if you're making um, progress or if you're having challenges in an area. The other one that you're probably familiar with is comparing against a provincial average. This tells you where do you stand in terms of the average competitive environment. Um, but where the network plays is saying, what about comparing against your peer group of a similar production system? Are you competitive and comparable with others with a similar production system? We have so much variety in the cow-calf sector that sometimes those provincial averages don't really make a lot of sense. And it can be helpful to look at a production system similar to your own to say, are their numbers in terms of a benchmark similar or different? And is there something that actually is possible for me to strive towards? So some of the graphs you're gonna see tonight have lots of benchmark numbers on them. Um, so it can look, pretty messy. But what I want you to think about is the potential possibilities it represents in that incremental improvement in competitiveness and profitability. So before we go further, I do want to recognize that we had a lot of people and do have a lot of people still involved in the cost of production network. And this wouldn't be possible without all of the producers that have participated over the last two years. But also want to thank our provincial coordinators, the nutritionists that have been working with us, as well as the various grad students and summer students and staff that have been involved in this. Um, it, it really has taken a lot of people to make this possible. So right now we have 46 benchmark cow-calf farms across the country from coast to coast with 186 participating producers. And we have um, many of them in the West, but we also have representation in the East. Uh, so there's definitely room and we're going to be we have sign up open um, for the coming year right now on the website. So if you are interested in participating, you can go to the website and sign up um, and we will be doing focus groups in the fall. And before we dig into the numbers, um, we do have to make a comment about the fact that our benchmark number and our benchmark year right now is 2021. And so we do have drought considerations. And for a lot of producers, it wasn't just a single event that meant that there is a single situation out there. We actually have, in general, three different scenarios. Some producers that were in a situation where they were forced to liquidate some of their herd. And so that actually increased their revenue for the 2021 calf crop year. And that also impacted them if they were in a province where government programs required inventory um, as proof for payment in terms of government programs. But for many of those who did liquidate in 21, um, the challenge is actually in the restocking year, which comes later. And we're going to talk a wee bit at the end about our drought scenarios and what those restocking options look like. The second option would be um, purchasing feed, which increased costs and decreased margins. Um, but if they were able to do that without having to liquidate, they may or may not have gotten some government money um, in order to compensate for some of that increased cost. Uh, and we do have government payments included in these benchmark years for 2021. Um, and those do vary by province. And then the third option is some producers did have stockpiled feed available, as well as the government programs, and so actually saw increased margins. For our farms that we 
indexed um, in 2020, we forward indexed to 2021. Each of those were modeled individually to evaluate what the feed shortfall would be and what the amount of feed purchased would be needed. And that is because um, each farm had a different amount of overproduction that they typically had. As well, within the modeling, we keep the herd size stable. So when you look at our results, um, and this is the big messy graphs for you, uh, but when you look at these, you actually see exactly what you would expect, which is an upward sloping supply curve. So we have high cost producers and we have low cost producers. And sometimes it's actually helpful, um, as you can see in the boxes, to look not at the average of everybody, but what is the average of that majority. So on the cash cost side, when you look at those farms that range between $800 and $1,000, they have an average of about $883 per cow, in contrast to the average for the overall um, network of about $924. Similarly, on the total cost side, um, looking at the, that sort of majority, which range between about $1,200 and just over $1,500. But I think the main point here is if you are aiming to be a low cost producer, you really need to aim for less than $800 on the cash cost side and less than $1,200 on the total cost side if you want to be thinking of yourself as a low cost producer. Um, otherwise, the averages here are more general for overall industry. One of the things we have been doing within the network is trying to make sure that we have a broad range of herd sizes in order to understand um, economies of scale. And you can see in the chart on the left that we have a nice sweeping um, upswing from about 35 head up to about 400 head. And then we've got a big jump and we've got a couple of farms in that 950 head. So we are still looking for farms to participate that are over 400 head um, so that we can sort of smooth out that curve. But on the right hand side, we've sort of grouped these in terms of total costs and looked at, you know, less than 100 head versus um, 100 head increments going up. And so you can see that there are definitely advantages to economies of scale. But what I want to point out is the fact that when you look at that orange line there, which is at about $1,000 of total cost per cow, it is possible as a small herd of less than 1,000, less than 100 head to be cost competitive with operations that are over 200 or over 300 head. It is definitely possible. And we do have benchmark farms out there that are able to do that. And so it's one that while there are definitely economies of scale, there are other factors that do impact this. So another way of looking at these numbers is to look at what is the type of winter feed stuff being used. And here you can see that you can be a high cost producer or a low cost producer with any type of feed stuff. There is no silver bullet winter feed stuff um, that is going to make you a low cost producer. However, hay is the most common winter feed stuff out there, and there's a reason for that. Um, and that is, you can see this circle. These are all of the hay farms that have cash costs of less than that $800. Um, so this is definitely possible if you want to be a low-cost producer using hay. Um, that's definitely possible and out there. Another way to look at this is to look at medium term profit. So medium term profits are looking at can you cover your cash and depreciation costs? And so anything below the line is not covering both their cash and depreciation. Anything above the line is covering that. And you can see that, hey, it's about 50-50, um, but no winter feed stuff has you know, guaranteed profits. That silage hay one has all three above the line. Maybe we need a few more additional benchmark farms to see if that holds true. 
looking at total winter feeding days, there's a big range in our benchmark farms, anywhere between 150 to 250 days, but really averaging right around that 200. Um, I always look at that number and think, wow, that's a lot of days. And that's probably because I'm thinking of full winter feeding days. Um, so not including the swath grazing, not including, you know, supplemental on pasture when you're expecting them to still be grazing to some extent um, for their daily nutritional requirements. But when you're they're on full winter feed. Um, and so that's on average about 165 days within the network at this point. So looking a little deeper into feed costs, this was a major mover um, in the 2021 year with costs in the West up almost $190 per cow. In the East, it was also up, but definitely more modest, um, around $30 a cow. So we, we definitely have that move. And really, when you think about that on a per head per day basis, it went from $2.33 per head per day in 2020. Um, and historically, we'd seen that, you know, anywhere between 2 and 2.30, jumping to almost being $3 per head per day um, last winter. And so uh, very high costs on the feed side really driving things. So when you think about, are you profitable as a cow-calf producer? One of the things we need to recognize is you're probably going to get what you aim for. So if you're evaluating things based on your whole farm, um, and maybe this is due to the financials that go to the accountant at the end of the year, um, or whether you're looking at it by enterprise, um, you're probably going to get what you aim for. Everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight and have talked about has been based on the enterprise. So all of these benchmark farms also have maybe uh, retained ownership um, for a period of time as a separate enterprise. They may have um, cash crops that they're also selling that impacts what things look like at the whole farm level. Everything I'm showing you is on a per cow basis, and it's specifically for the cow-calf enterprise. The other thing that I've already mentioned is, are you covering short, medium, or long-term costs? Your short-term costs are cash. If you cannot cover cash costs in the short term, you either are going to end up going out of business, or you're going to need another income source to compensate and cover that on a regular basis. In the medium term, you have to be able to cover both cash as well as depreciation. Depreciation means you're able to replace machinery or buildings when the time comes. If you can't cover that, again, you're going to be looking for other income sources to be able to replace that machinery or buildings in order to continue operating. And really, if you cannot cover your medium term costs with that depreciation, um, it really makes it hard to stay in business. Then the third one is your long-term costs, also called your economic profit. And it's this question of, are you actually able to provide a market value return on your investment to land, labor, and capital? So when you think of unpaid labor, if you got sick, could you pay someone to come and do it? You know, if it's manual labor, um, come and do it for a manual labor wage. Um, land, are you actually able to give yourself a rental um, for your land so that you have a return to your land investment? And similar on overall capital. And so that's the language that I'm going to be using is short, medium, and long-term profits, um, reflecting of if you're covering your cash depreciation and opportunity costs. So when we look at the network in general in 2021, we saw a big jump in cash costs really being driven by those higher feed costs that we've already seen, and then modest increases in depreciation and opportunity costs, overall total costs being up about 12%. And we saw only a modest increase in revenue of about 2%. And we have an average herd size of about 200 head. 
And so what that means is that we had fewer farms being able to cover their short, medium, and long-term costs with a drop of about five percentage points um, on the short term, a much bigger drop in terms of that medium term going from 72% to 57%. And then on our long-term costs, only 12% of the benchmark farms were covering their opportunity costs and getting that market value return to their investment. And then when we look at this regionally, and we do recognize that we have a small number of farms in some of these provinces. So the average may not be representative for the province as a whole because there's more production systems there. But just some things to take note of. We had some big increases in cash costs in the West with the drought, with a big increase in Saskatchewan up 36%, um, followed by Manitoba and Alberta. And that really did increase their total cost structure. Um, and the interesting part is we saw that on average for the farms in Alberta and Manitoba, that they were still able to cover their medium term costs. Whereas in BC and Saskatchewan, on average, they went from covering their medium term costs to covering their short term costs. It should be noted that in Manitoba, um, all of the farms are larger, um, whereas in the other provinces, we have quite a few um, small farms less than 100 head. And then when we go east, we do see an increase in costs, um, more modest for Ontario and Quebec, up uh, 6% um, in Ontario on the total cost side and up 4% in Quebec. Uh, Ontario also moved from covering their medium term costs to only covering their short term costs on average, whereas Quebec continues to cover their medium term costs. And the Maritimes, um, just covering their short-term costs on average for the farms out there. So we wanted to get to the point of asking, what do profitable farms do? And what we did is we took our farms um, on the left-hand side, you can see them on the medium-term profit, and we broke them into thirds. So we have our high profitable group, our medium profitable group, and our low profitable group on the left. And just so that you know, um, on the right hand side, this is the graph for looking at them on a short term profit. So that's 79% covering their short term cash costs. Um, but I used the medium term profits for all of this analysis. And what we saw was calf mortality was relatively stable between the three groups. So was weaning rates. Um, weaning weights actually declined um, from the low to the high group, but when you put it into a 205 day adjusted weaning weight, it is more stable. But the two big factors driving things were herd size, which increased, um, and mature cow weight, which decreased. So I just wanted to dig into those a wee bit more. And so you can see here that for the farms that are less than 100 head, we have about 47% that were covering their medium term costs for the group between 100 and 200 head. Again, about 50% covering those medium term costs. But once you get over 200 head, we're looking at 89% or 75%. So we've got the ability of those economies of scale to spread those overheads over more cows um, really being a driving factor. But the other aspect was smaller cow size. Um, and when we look at all of the farms, we saw our high profitability group being about 47 pounds lighter than the low group. And when we looked at it, of looking at just at those less than 100 head um, farms, the impact was even bigger. That high profitability group um, in this smaller herd size was about 78 pounds lighter. We have a wee bit of a different structure here in the over 100 head group with actually the medium profitable group being the heaviest cows, but we still have the high profitable group about 20 pounds lighter. And so when you have smaller cows, one of the concerns is, are you going to have fewer pounds weaned, fewer pounds sold to make revenue on? And that's what I want to talk about weaning weights and the fact that 
it sort of looks like you have a decline with these larger herds. But when you do that adjustment to 205 days, it really shows that it's not about your average daily gain on these calves, but more about the age at weaning. And so this can also be addressed then when you look at that retained ownership enterprise um, for some of these herds. But we're just looking at the cow-calf enterprise. The other thing is looking at the cost structures. So we do see a big drop. Um, here you see uh, opportunity costs at almost 600 for the low group and over 200 on the depreciations. And they drop significantly to the medium group, almost in half to about 306 and 124 here. And when you look at the cash and feed costs, the big drop here, um, cash costs of 970 and feed costs driving that at around 600, dropping down to about 750 and 460 in the high group. So how are these high profitable producers um, getting those lower feed costs? Is it due to fewer days on feed? Well, actually it's not. Um, the high profitable group actually had more days on full winter feed and only slightly more days in terms of total feeding days. So that wasn't what was driving this at all. It was actually their cost of producing that feed. The majority of our network farms are using homegrown feed um, with only a few of them relying on purchased feed. And so this really came down to what is it costing them to produce things on their operation? And land costs are relatively stable between the three groups. You've got some decline on capital costs, but the really big driver was labor cost. And that's a combination of the number of hours needed to produce that feed, as well as the wage um, that's being paid to produce that feed. So, um, moving on to our drought recovery scenarios, um, this is something that we did last fall and this spring, really asking the question of uh, for the 17 farms that we had at the time from BC to Northwest Ontario, if these farms uh, were to have a regular culling rate or if they were to increase it to 25, 50 or 75 percent, um, what would be the best way to rebuild their herd? Um, recognizing that for a lot of producers, there's different considerations um, in terms of that liquidation, if there was local feed available for them to purchase and their desire to maintain the genetics of their herd and even just cash flow. But asking that question, is it best to rebuild from within their herd or purchase replacements? And one of the reasons we wanted to ask this is we know that with the economies of scale being a major driver, that the impact of cost structure, the longer it takes to get back to your ideal herd size for your operation, you end up with high per cow costs um, and you're not able to necessarily cover them. But also the concerns that we saw from the drought back in the 1980s, where you have bread heifer prices increasing 30, 36% from the drought year to the peak two years later, and the concern about selling low and having to be forced to buy high in order to rebuild. There's also biosecurity concerns, as well as suitability of being able to buy bread heifers that are suitable to the environment and management style you have. But the overall objective that we wanted to answer with this study was how do you minimize the equity drain on the operation? And when we looked at rebuilding without heifers, um, one of the main challenges we had with a regular retention rate was that we were unable to rebuild to the original herd size within a 10-year period. And that resulted in a prolonged period of lost economies of scale with that lower herd size number and having available pasture resources after the drought had finished, um, just pasture not being optimized. So what we did is we had a more aggressive heifer retention rate to rebuild as quickly as possible, recognizing that there would be less revenue in those early years, negatively impacting cash flow. 
but we really did need to make those adjustments um, to make it um, realistic. And then when we looked at the purchasing bred heifers in order to rebuild the herd, we basically said, okay, if you called in 21 and you purchase bred heifers in the fall of 22 with the idea of being back to your original herd size by your calving of 2023. This meant that farms were able to rebuild back to their original herd size um, significantly faster if they were calling 50% um, or more. But it definitely required taking out debt um, and being able to deal with the cash flow deficits. There was interest to be paid on those loans. Um, and so it was definitely a more risky strategy. Um, but for the scenarios that were higher um, culling rates of like 75%, uh, it actually was more profitable and had less of an equity drain in the long run because of that ability to regain economies of scale faster um, when you didn't have heifers within your own herd to rebuild from. So while cash flow is always a consideration, um, what we found was that uh, if it was a one-year drought, purchasing feed was the best option. If you were calling 25 to 50 percent, rebuilding with your own heifers from within the herd was uh, the most profitable option for the majority of the farms. And if you were calling 75 percent, um, that purchasing heifers uh, was the most ideal to rebuild in a timely fashion. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to Sydney. Thanks, Brenna, that was great. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for Brenna, please put them in the Q&A um, portion of the Zoom on the bottom of your screen, and then we'll be sure to be, get to them during the live Q&A. Um, but with that, I am excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Hui Ting Huang. Um, Hui Ting is responsible for maintaining a wide variety of national and international data sets, writing for regular publications. A major part of her role is background research and statistical analysis on CRS projects. Her language skills have contributed to the reliable international data that CRS util utilizes. She has developed decision-making models using CanFax's unique database and has a background in survey analysis. She manages the Canadian Box Beef Report and assists with data requests. Huting joined CanFax Research Services in 2013. And please join me in, um, in welcoming Huting. Thank you, Cindy, for the uh, introduction, and thanks for having me here tonight. Um, so just now, Brenna gave us a great uh, overview of the benchmark farms in 2021, and another piece of the uh, cost of production network, uh, it's about sharing thoughts and experiences and asking the what ifs. Um, in the networks, uh, in the past two years, uh, our producers uh, uh, with the similar production system got to get together as a focus group to discuss a variety of topics. And I'm, uh, I have some of the topics here on the screen here. So uh, we talked about um, their vision of the day-to-day -day of their dream farms and also talk about um, some of the opportunities and constraints they they're facing in terms of land, labor, and capitals. And also talked about things like uh, things they had tried before but didn't work and also share the experience on uh, how they make things work and uh, what was the challenge. And we also asked the question about what they were interested in changing over the next five years, uh, how to achieve it, and what are some of the potential trade-offs. And these are our future farm scenarios. So in general, uh, we observed uh, three major areas that producers are interested in changing. Um, the first is around reducing input costs. Um, some example would be looking to uh, extend the grazing season or reduce the amount of purchased feed or share machinery with labor with neighbors. And the second area is around productivity improvements, um, such as tightening up uh, the calving season to increase winning weight or reduce calf death loss. 
And the third area is around um, marketing strategies, um, such as diversifying marketing by selling bread heifers or by, uh, or by cattle to graze in the summer. And what our team did is in terms of analysis uh, was to try to estimate the potential cost and benefits of these practice change over a five year period. So next, I would like to share um, some of our key findings uh, in this analysis, uh, fo focusing on the two scenarios selected by the most farms. Um, the first scenario uh, is the extend grazing season through rotational grazing. And the second uh, is tightening up the calving season to increase winning weights. So let's dive into the first scenario, extend grazing season through rotational grazing. So for this scenario, we made some assumption. Uh, first, we keep uh, crop yield and crop and cattle prices steady with the baseline year to eliminate some of the market volatility and environmental factors. And also we assume a longer grazing season um, is achieved by greater grazing management. And this requires the upfront purchase of a portable electric fencing system to allow for smaller pasture sizes. And this costs about 8,900 in year one. And there is also additional labor required for rotational grazing. And we assume um, weekly moves uh, with additional three hours of labor per week. And we also assume a 10% increase in stocking rate uh, with a 13 to 21 days longer grazing season across different farms. So the major additional cost in this scenario is the upfront investment in fencing in year one and also the additional labor for rotational grazing. And the major economic benefit is the reduced feed costs and labor from fewer winter feeding days. So for some of the farms that reported uh, forage sales, we also assume there is additional revenue from selling surplus forage as well. So if you look at the chart uh, on the right, it shows the change in profits related to rotational grazing. And if you look at the, the blue bars, it looks like a V shape uh, with the profit drop in first year due to the upfront fencing costs and then rebound in the following years. And the orange line here shows the average impact over the five year period. So when the orange line is above zero, it means the farm can pay off the additional cost, the upfront cost within five years, meaning this scenario could be feasible for the, this particular farms. So um, let's look at this chart for all the farms. And um, if you look at the orange lines here, you can see there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, differences. Um, there are some above zeros and some below zeros. So that means the rotational grazing strategy might have very different impact on different farms. For example, um, the results seems pretty positive for um, example BC1, that's uh, our farm in uh, British Columbia and Alberta 3 and also Quebec 3 and adding about um, more than three more than $30 profit per cow but for some farms like BC2 AB4 the orange lines are below zero meaning the initial investment may not be paid off in five years so the question is what makes the difference and why it works for some farms but not the others so to answer this, um, we first look at the cost. And what we found is herd size matters. Um, so in this future farm scenario, the major cost is uh, fencing. And the cost of this portable fencing system um, doesn't change uh, much uh, by herd size. So when farms with small, when farms uh, had smaller herd size, it, it tends to have higher cost per cow. And when the bigger herd are, and the bigger herd are getting economics, economies of scales. So this may mean um, these smaller farms may need to look for some cheaper fencing alternatives to make it work. And the economies of scale is not all the answer to the question because there are some small herds like Quebec 3. Uh, if you remember the previous chart, this has a pretty positive outcome. So 
what are the other factors? Um, so when we look at the major economic benefit of this scenario is the saving on winter feeding cost. And this chart shows the saving on feed cost per cow from low cost operation on the left and high cost operations on the right. So what we observed here is that the farm with higher feed costs um, were able to save more money. So as you can see here, Ontario 2, Alberta 4, Quebec 4, and Quebec 3, um, they're all seeing most saving. And these farms all purchase a portion of their winter feed, which is usually more expensive than homegrown. And when there is fewer winter feeding days, they purchase less feed and save more money. And last but not least, um, there is uh, an additional put uh, additional revenue from selling surplus forage for some of the farms, uh, which you can see in the blue bars here. And this only apply for the farms that reported forage sales before. So, uh, and with this revenue added, uh, we can see BC1, Alberta 3, and Saskatchewan 5, they are having a much higher economic benefit from this um, practice. So, um, just going back to the previous chart, but with all the explanation added um, to answer what makes it work for some benchmark farms, but not. I think we have a better idea here. Um, for example, it works for BC1 uh, because they had additional revenue from selling hay despite of small herd size. And um, it worked for BC Ontario 2, Quebec 3 because um, there is more saving on purchase feed. And so that makes the scenario feasible for them. And on the other hand, it may not be feasible for Alberta 4 and uh, Quebec 4 with a small herd size and the cost saving for Saskatchewan 3 and also Quebec 1 is not that significant as they already have low feed costs. So I think uh, what we learned from this scenario is that uh, when, we when we are considering a practice change like rotational grazing, um, the things to consider are, uh, for example, herd size, um, is there uh, economies of scale or if it's a small herd, how do we uh, lower the upfront cost? And also um, the feed cost, um, there may be more profit in making the change when feed costs are high. And also uh, is the practice change uh, going to bring us extra revenue? And also what is the extra labor required for this practice change and also specific on rotational grazing what is what is the room for improvement in terms of pasture capacity carrying capacity so now let's shift gear and talk about our second scenario uh, that were chosen by multiple farms that's uh, that's tightening up our calving season so for each farm, we did two options in this scenario. The first one is shortening to three cycles. And the second option is more aggressive, uh, not only adjusting to three cycles, but also have 90% calves uh, born in the first two cycles. And we assume these are achieved gradually over five years by pulling the bulls five days earlier each year, also by up uh, by front loading uh, the breeding heifers two to four weeks ahead of the um, cow herd in terms of breeding. So um, there is not much cash investment in this scenario and the major outcome is heavier winning weights. And depending on uh, what the baseline distribution is, um, the increase in winning weights varies by farm. Uh, the farms with a longer calving season uh, tend to have more significant increase in the average winning weights. And overall, we have a range of 4 to 20 pounds increase in average winning weight across these farms. And because there is minimum upfront investment, um, the blue chart at the blue bars here shows the revenue uh, gradually increase over the five year period and plateau uh, when the desired uh, calving distribution is achieved. So let's look at the result. Um, the revenue gained um, on 
the scenario for, dif for different farms varies, ranging from around $5 to $30 per head. And uh, this is mainly driven by the differences in terms of the, the change in winning weights and also the different cattle prices reported by producers. Uh, the farms that already have a tight calving season had, tend to have tend to have lower uh, revenue gain. For example, Ontario 4, um, with a less than four pound gain, we're looking at a five, about $5 increase in revenue. Um, while other farms with a flatter distribution to start with, um, they tend to see higher revenue gain, which means it may worth investing the time and effort in tightening up the calving season. And the key message um, we learned from here, I think, from this scenario is that it is uh, important to um, know where your current calving distribution is and to know what is the room for improvement. So the time you spend on record keeping during calving season may be really uh, worth it. So, um, so we talked about uh, the two scenarios chosen by um, most firms, but there are more to explore. Um, so when there are multiple areas a farm is looking to change to imp or improve, uh, it is important to put all the options on the tables and, cons and um, look at the potential cost, benefit, and as well as risk. Um, Let's take Alberta 3 for as an example. So this farm is looking to improve their calving distribution, reduce their feed costs by shortening the winter feeding period, and also uh, looking to diversify their marketing by selling bread heifers. And all these three practices have different levels of risk. For example, adjusting calving season may require minimum additional costs, but the potential gain is relatively small. And selling bread heifer, um, the potential uh, net benefit might be large, but there might be uh, other uh, risk. Uh, for example, uh, the volatility in terms of prices and also the uncertainty in heifer performance. So I think um, to decide which needle to move, it really depends on the opportunity, uh, the operations risk tolerance and also um, taking all the factors like uh, current market environment, weather condition and all other factors into consideration. And this really brings me back to um, the value of the cost of production network where producers can get together to discuss uh, what they learn from their experience and ask the what ifs question and learn from each other. So. Um, this is all I have. Uh, I would like to um, hand it back to Brenna to talk more about um, the production network. Thank you, Hoi Ting. So we have a number of resources available on our website, and I just wanted to show you where you can go to get those. Um, if you go to canfax.ca um, and you click on the cost of production logo, uh, there's two pages there. One is the cost of production results page that gives you individual farm summaries for each of our benchmark farms. You can look at the tables and say, okay, which of these has a production system the most similar to me? And then look at what those benchmarks are. You can also look at the future farm scenarios um, that Hoiting just talked about that are available for each of those farms. Um, and see which ones have trade-offs, which ones have high risks, and which ones have um, a cost benefit that makes sense. And then we have a cost of production analysis page. And this is really our annual summaries that are coming out. We have a number of fact sheets available there. Um, we've done a number of case studies comparing Canadian farms to international farms with similar production systems. Um, we also have videos like this one uh, with presentations on them, as well as some of the survey results from the short questionnaires that producers answered when they did their focus groups. 
But as mentioned earlier, we are going into our third and final year of data collection. Um, so you can sign up between now and November 30th. Uh, and that information is about telling us, you know, what your calving date is, um, what your weaning date is, what your typical winter feed stuff is, so that we can group you with other producers that have a similar production system that you're going to be able to learn from. We then um, contact you in December or January to schedule um, data collection in the first quarter of the new year. And some of you may be saying, you want to know what? My production system isn't on the website. Uh, that's fantastic. It means that you can sign up and fill that gap. We have a number of missing production systems and we totally recognize that. Um, and that's why we're doing another year of data collection. Uh, so if you are a, a larger herd um, over 400 head, uh, we would love to see you. We're also looking to fill the gap of year round grazing um, and some of the other uh, production practices out there. Uh, it doesn't have to be a limit to this list. Uh, we're looking for a whole variety of things. So with that, I do want to thank BCRC, um, who's supporting the Cost of Production Network, as well as all of our provincial coordinators who really make this possible. So with that, I'll stop sharing and um, see, Sydney, if we have any questions. Thanks, Brennan, Hitting that we got that was awesome. Yeah, you guys did a really good job. Uh, in terms of questions, I had a few written down, and then next slide, you guys answered them all for me. So I'm sure people have similar experiences. Um, but we do have two questions here. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to mention that the resources as well as the links in order to participate for the cost production network are in the chat right now. Um, so if you guys are interested and want to check out more, learn a little bit more, click on those links there as well. Um, with that, we're going to jump into the Q&A here. So our first question is, um, your definition of mature cow weight, is it just average weight of cows in the herd? Is it average weight of cows in the herd over five years of age, adjusted for body condition score, etc., related to possibility that smaller cows could just be thinner cows? Great comment. Um, basically, we're using mature cow weight that a producer would use to calculate their winter feeding rations. Um, and this may be specifically different than the weight of their cull cows. So if they're selling um, thin cows uh, as their culls, that's a different weight. We, we collect that as well. Um, but this would be what guys are using for calculating their winter feed ration. Thanks, Brenna. Um, we have a more situational question. So um, what um, comments do you have regarding small farmers who like to overfeed in the winter and how do you account for situations like that? I love this question. Um, because this was a question that after we collected our data the first year, um, we had to figure out what we were going to do. And uh, we went to nutritionists and said, help us. Uh, first of all, um, but we also wanted to reflect what these benchmark farms were doing, and that was the information that producers gave us. So we really said that if the nutritionist told us that there was overfeeding on this benchmark farm, we actually kept it and included it for a couple of reasons. One was the fact that there was a variety of winter feeding methods, some with more feed waste than others. And so we wanted to be reflective of what they were using in terms of their total costs. If they were using a feeding method that had more feed waste and they were considering that an investment that goes into their pasture. But the other aspect is we have a project um, working with the Canadian Roundtable of Sustainable Beef uh, that's being done at the University of Manitoba with Dr. Kim Ominski and one of her grad students that's looking at uh, our future farm scenarios and saying, what are some of these future farm scenarios that actually reduce and actually say, what if we did ration balancing? Um, what are not only the economics of that cost saving, but what is the um, improvement in terms of greenhouse gas reduction in those emissions? And so we, we wanted to be as realistic as possible when we did that. 
and that allowed us to then include that in that study that will be coming out next year. Thanks, Brenna. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's still on that if you have any other questions that have come up during this discussion, to please continue to put them in the Q&A and we'll definitely get to them. Um, in the meantime, um, I did have a question written down here. Um, what are some of the findings that you've discovered through this project that surprised you or that you found super interesting? Like maybe you went in with a preconceived notion of something and were completely off base. Um, part of it is, I don't know if I had many preconceived notions going in. I was very aware of the fact that I'm from Saskatchewan and I know production systems in Saskatchewan. And it didn't take many focus groups for me to fully acknowledge that I knew nothing about production systems in Eastern Canada. Um, they operate in an environment and a situation that was completely foreign to me. And so I was very comfortable asking all of the dumb questions, um, specifically moisture content in different feeds that I thought should have been obvious and the answer was not obvious. Um, the other piece was a lot of what we do with this is trying to understand what producers have already told us. And can we actually back up some of those comments with data? And I would actually say the cow size in terms of mature cow weight really driving um, profitability was one that I had been told years and years ago that when it actually came up in the data, I was excited to see that, you know, anecdotal comment from producers that they had seen on their own operation and experienced to actually be able to have data that um, showed it. Yuting, do you have anything that surprised you over this process? Um, I wouldn't say surprise, but um, something that makes me excited about the industry is uh, how um, producers are trying different technology and different strategy in terms of their operations. Um, for example, I talked to a producer who um, do year-round grazing and have a very tight wind, uh, calving season, like they, they calve all the calves in um, one cycle. And just excited to listen to them and to know how they did it how they achieved it. Thank you both. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the Q&A. Um, I would encourage you who are still on to please go onto the CanFax and get a little bit more information. And especially if you're interested, um, as well as check out BCRC resources. Um, but with that, I wanna thank um, both Brenna and Hu Ting, you guys did an excellent job and it was great having you on tonight. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sydney. And I just want to invite anyone that if you have ideas of questions that you ask yourself about cost of production and analysis that you would like to do or like to see us do, um, we would be happy to dig into those questions. Just send them into the office.